we don't need an asset target rich environment to do well. We're going to make one or two new investments a year. That's kind of been the history of the firm. Um, and we think we can find one of those in, in pretty much any market environment. Our strategy is to find the best businesses in the world. We call them simple, predictable, free cash flow, generative, super durable growth companies, businesses that earn high returns on capital, have minimally capital intensive, don't require constant access to the capital markets in order to implement their business models, are kind of undisruptible, you know, wide moats, sustainable competitive advantages, not exposed to extrinsic factors we can't control like movements at commodity prices or interest rates, et cetera. So the ideal business, and of course you want to buy it at a fair price. And because other people like to buy ideal great companies that uh, uh, which have these characteristics, it's rare to buy fine businesses like this at, a, at an attractive price. And one of the, uh, what's enabled us to do so historically is the fact that um, even you know the greatest businesses in the world go through some challenging moments. Uh, managements and boards make strategic decisions that are on, not ideal. Unfortunate events occur um, and or uh, investors misappraise the quality of the business. And those tend to be our targets. And I think we're quite well known for being, and one, we're, we're highly concentrated. We deploy our capital in eight, nine, 10 investments. Uh, and top three could be half the portfolio. And so it's a very high degree of concentration. That's the focus on business quality, balance sheet strength, durability, minimizing risk loss. You know, those are obviously, you know, kind of key reasons. We also tend to be the largest shareholder and often, if not the largest, the largest non-index fund shareholder of the company. Uh, so we have a lot of influence and we've used that influence uh, to make changes when the changes are necessary. Um, management change, changes in boards, uh, as well as just, you know, most of the time we're just applauding from the sidelines and have an occasional idea of how to make a business more valuable. You know, with the management team, uh, one of our holdings coming in on Monday, we can spend a day together just talking about the company and uh, sharing some ideas that we have on how we can help. But that's the basic idea, long only, super high quality, durable growth companies. That's the bulk of the strategy. And then, a subset of the strategy is looking for risk in markets and trying to hedge those risks. And so, you know, the best evidence I can give is pre-financial crisis, we were concerned about what was going on in the credit markets. So we built a very large notional short position in credit by purchasing credit default swaps on the bond insurers, on Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, on the banks. Um, and as a result, uh, you know, S&P was down 52% in, I think, 08 and I think our Peak decline was 18%. It was just momentary. And we finished the year down only a few percent and we we're up 40% the next, driven by that hedging gain and the, the redeployment of those proceeds in, in buying stocks. And then last year, when we became quite concerned about the pandemic in February, we did the same thing. Uh, we, are, we thought the best way to express this concern and in a, a risk minimizing way is to, again, buy credit default swaps, but a very large notional position in the credit default swap market and then spreads gap very you know, widely as uh, it became clear that this was gonna be a pandemic. And then we reversed that position as our portfolio declined in value, our stocks went down and our hedge became enormously valuable. So the, the hedge actually on a mark to market basis mitigated almost our entire mark to market loss. But more importantly, uh, we were, it gave us capital to invest over 2 billion of capital to invest in a market that was down a large amount. And most recently, you know, our biggest kind of black swan fear for the markets earlier this year, we became concerned about inflation. We thought inflation could lead to higher rates, we thought higher rates could lead to lower values in the equity markets. And we built, again, a very large notional position betting that rates would go higher. We did this using swaptions, which are sort of a, an option on uh, an interest rate swap, which is a way to express that kind of bet. But these, the, the three things I mentioned are, they're small. You know, the capital commitments are 1%, 1.5% of capital, you know, numbers like this, um, but they can turn into very, very large numbers in the event that the, you know, sort of outlier event takes place. And so those are really the two prongs to the strategy. Uh, the latter prong is episodic. I can't guarantee we're going to be able to hedge every extrinsic black swan risk and that we're going to be there in advance, but it's something we think about and it's been a meaningful contributor over time. But pretty much everything else we own 
you know, have done quite quite well this year. Um, you know, you work your way through the list. You know, Hilton stock's been a very strong performer. I, mean, I could look up the relative performance. You know, Hilton, Chipotle, uh, Lowe's, uh, even you know Howard Hughes. Um, you know, our investments have done quite well. We we exited a position at uh, You know, more than doubled in uh, the last relatively short period of time. And then our holdings in. Uh, Domino's Pizza. That was a new investment. We sold our stake in Starbucks, uh, you know, a double in the last year, and replaced it uh, with uh, a new stake in Domino's. We acquired in the mid 300s. The stock is in the high 400s. So our our strong preference is to find a business that's already doing the right thing with a management team we like at a price we like, um, and we've been able to find that in the last several years. Uh, Starbucks, a prime example, um, Agilent, um, but even. With well-run, great companies, you know we can be helpful, um, and uh, we are always looking for the next big idea. We don't disclose it until we obviously identify it. We don't need an asset target-rich environment to do well. We're going to make one or two new investments a year. That's kind of been the history of the firm, um, and we think we can find one of those in, in pretty much any market environment. You know, one investment this year so far is Domino's Pizza. Um, the other thing we did this year was this interest rate hedge, which has been it's up about fourfold since we we made the investment. Uh, and we're always working on new ideas, and I look forward to telling you about one after we're in a position to do so. Um, but the sales stalling wouldn't be a reason for us to buy a stake in a company. What caught, what motivated us to buy a stake in a company is if we thought it was a really great business and it was undervalued, and if we thought the reason for undervaluation was fixable, whether we fixed it or the current management team fixed it. But our strong preference is just to work with the existing team. Where do you see markets going into 2022? I would say predicting short-term stock market movements is pretty much a fool's game. And it's not something we do. It's it's an, un, an uncertain world. Is it a more uncertain world today than it was a year ago or five years ago? Maybe, probably, who knows? Um, but that's why the emphasis of our strategy is owning these what I call super durable, undisruptible companies, right? People are going to be ordering pizza and having it delivered and they're going to eat it. And for $8, you can feed a family of four with a a pizza pie. That's a pretty good proposition. And you get it delivered in 28 minutes by a smiling person and comes in a box and keeps it warm. That's going to continue. You know, uh, Chipotle is, you know, building a couple hundred, you know, 200, 200 plus stores a year. And they are earning extraordinary returns when they open those stores and they provide a great product that the customer loves. Um, you know, Lowe's is the uh, second, number two to Home Depot in the home improvement space. But um, Marvin Ellison, new CEO over the last several years, has come in and done a fantastic job. And there's no reason why that business shouldn't be neck and neck with Home Depot. And he's, and he's made enormous progress taking market share, et cetera. We think that continues. Um, we think, you know, Hilton's stock was down the most, I think, of anything we owned when the pandemic was announced. We meaningfully increased our position in the company in the mid 50s stock today is 140 you know they've they've figured out how to run hotels more cost efficiently and hilton itself doesn't own any meaningful number of hotels the capital and the hotels are owned and put up by others and hilton owns a brand royalty on those companies so when you own businesses that have very very attractive economic characteristics and they're largely immune not immune on a day-to-day basis but they're protected from interest rates moving up or down or commodity prices moving up or down. I think the maybe single most important characteristic today is going to be pricing power. You know, if the cost of your inputs go up, you better be able to raise price, not lose the customer. And that is true for every one of our companies.